To the people of the city and the county palatine of Lancaster, greetings. Know ye and rejoice by virtue of the Queen's county palatine of Lancaster, the citizens of the hundreds of Lonsdale, north and south of the Sands, a mountainous Leyland, Blackburn, Salford and West Derby are forever entitled to style themselves Lancastrians. Throughout the county palatine, from the Furnace Fells to the River Mersey, from the Irish Sea to the Pennines, this day shall ever mark the people's pleasure in that excellent distinction. True Lancastrians, proud of the Red Rose and loyal to our sovereign Duke. God bless Lancashire and God bless the Queen, Duke of Lancaster. This is Lancashire Business Week, and that was the wonderful Simon Entwistle, Lancashire tourism superstar, giving us our daily Lancashire Day proclamation. A little belatedly, perhaps, but with much gusto. I'm Richard Slater, I'm the publisher of Lancashire Business View, and you join us today for the third of our Lancashire Business Week sessions, Engagement, Communication and Wellbeing. Our overarching theme for this week of events and activities is From Resilience to Recovery. And to tackle this, we have gathered a stellar cast of more than 30 businesses, rather 30 experts from within businesses, industry, the professional services, education and training, the media, politics and more. So far this week, we've staged mini symposiums on the themes of new customers, new markets, on, and also on skills and recruitment. Those sessions are available on demand at our YouTube channel and as written reports at lancashirebusinessview.co.uk and just see the chat box for those uh, links. Tomorrow, we will dive deep into leading and managing change before going live and in person for our Resilience and Recovery Forum at the new £20 million Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, or the AMRC, at Salisbury Enterprise Zone on Friday. Ours will be the first ever event stage at this superb new facility. We have a few remaining tickets and you can register your interest again by following the link in the chat box. Now, before I introduce this session, a word of thanks for our Lancashire Business Week patrons, partners and supporters who are Beaver and Struthers, Big Tank Productions, Burnley.co.uk, Burnley College, Cotton Court, Infor Group, Lancashire Skills Hub, Nugent Sante, Zigaflow, AMRC, Lexus Preston and Boost Business Lancashire. And we are delighted to have CG Professional as the headline patron for Lancashire Business Week. As with all our virtual events, Monday to Thursday this week, we'll be opening with an interview and moving to a panel discussion. You are welcome to join the conversation at any point today by sending observations and questions, of course, into the chat box. And at the conclusion, in around 40 minutes, we'll bring you all on screen for networking, so do stay with us. Today, our focus is on engagement, communication and well-being. And let's just put that into some kind of context. Well, engagement, communication and well-being all feed into the staff retention piece. And we all know it's cheaper to retain than recruit. And of course, holding on to the best people has always been a challenge. But with so much disruption to working life over the past 20 months, it's a challenge that has been exacerbated. We'll consider some of the strategies that are working and hear from those people who are implementing them. One key area of improvement which relates to retention and which has been accelerated by the pandemic is an increased emphasis by many businesses to engage better with their staff, communicate more effectively and implement well-being strategies. Videos, seminars, newsletters, meet the boss, online meetings, these and other means of staying in touch and keeping teams engaged has been much enhanced. And we wonder which of those practices are likely to continue. In a little while, we'll welcome our panellists, but to help us frame today's conversation, I'd first like to welcome Lisa Sauerbutz. Lisa Sauerbutz founded Cube HR in 2017. Since then, the company has grown in size and now employs five, supporting more than 100 retained clients and hundreds of other small businesses. Throughout the pandemic, Lisa and her team provided free support to businesses with newsletters, videos, drop-in sessions. It was an engagement strategy that paid off. In 2021, Cube HR doubled in size and was the recipient of numerous business 
and industry accolades. Welcome to you, Lisa. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Lisa. Richard. How are you doing? Good morning. Now, I'm, I'm, I've come to you first because of this. You advise so many businesses on their HR issues. And I think that gives you a really broad view of the challenges that business and industry are facing. So what I want to know is, what have you learned over the past 20 months? Perhaps you're reflecting your own thoughts and reflecting the thoughts of your clients. But what have you learned about the importance of workplace engagement, communication and well-being? I think everybody's learned so much, Richard, haven't they, over the last 20 months. But when I reflect on the journey that our clients have been on, the businesses that we've seen adapt the best are the ones and, and, and that have faced min minimum disruption are the ones that have communicated most effectively. It always, always comes back to communication. And those businesses that have opened those effective communication channels, we've just seen the engagement stay there. It's just been consistent in a lot of um it, clients it's actually improved immensely um you know it's been a really really uncertain time it still is people are worried about the futures we know when we see the job market we've never had as many jobs because people are worried about making that leap so they're, they're staying where they are and um, you know naturally we are a, we are a curious species aren't we so we want to know what's happening and even where businesses have had to make difficult decisions as long as they've been communicated with and told the truth and employers have been open, we're actually OK with that. We're pretty resilient um, and we can adapt to change as long as we are informed and consulted. So bad news is OK because we can adapt to that change. So where communication fails, distrust then comes in, engagement levels drop and it just becomes this really difficult place to, to come back from. So we've seen it firsthand that an engaged workforce is a communicated with workforce. And we've also seen that, you know, where employers through that communication channel are focused on well-being of their staff before profit, we've really seen them shine. Um, and, and they've actually come on leaps and bounds. You know, even those industries that have been impacted through the pandemic uh, have actually are in a really good place because the staff have been engaged and on that journey with them. I'll ask you a little bit more about the kind of um, strategies that have been implemented in a minute, but I, I, I mean, I don't want to be too assumptive here. I, I'm assuming that when we have, um, you know, great engagement and communication and well-being strategies in place, that makes businesses better. Is the evidence there, Lisa, that that makes businesses better? Yeah, I think we've just got to look at retention rates, especially in businesses that are struggling to, um, to, to, to recruit. You know, a lot of our clients that are in those sectors aren't in that position because we've worked with them to focus on engagement. And it is, it's, it, communication and engagement is not a, a one-way thing. It's not for the employer to say, we're doing this, we're doing this. It's to, they're not expected to have all the answers. It's about partnering with their employees, getting their feedback. You know, what can we do to make this a better place to work? What can we do to make you feel secure and confident in this environment? And again, you know, we, we've supported a lot of our clients with that and where we've listened, even if you can't do everything that your employees are asking of you to do, if yeah. you go back to them and say, listen, we can't do this for this reason, we're okay with that. We're absolutely fine with it. And where we do say, do you know what? We never thought of that. What a brilliant idea. Let's do it. Those employees are going, oh my God, I have a voice. I'm being listened to. And it, it's just, as long as you carry on doing that and it's always, it's a continuous thing, communication and engagement and well-being. It's not just, oh, we better do something because we're in a pandemic. You know, again, those businesses that were doing all this before the pandemic have just done business as usual and carried on having that really engaged workforce. Well, tell us about some of the things that you've seen that you've been impressed by, Lisa, that, that you feel would, would represent good practice in communication, engagement and well-being. Oh, gosh, right. So many examples. Um, obviously, we all, most of us had to jump online. Um, you know, you're on mute. Well, here we are. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, as, as, as we still are. So that led to a lot of people feeling lonely, isolated. We are naturally social animals, aren't we? So we had people doing... Um, online lunches, quizzes. Um, we had people doing exercise sessions online. Uh, one of the, the best things that we saw our clients do was just say to people, listen, don't worry when you work. We get that you're homeschooling. We get that you're really stressed. We're totally on board with it. You work your hours when you need to work your hours. So that massive amount of flexibility and people not having to worry about being mum, dad, carer, um, 
employee uh, was, was absolutely fantastic. We had clients sending gift vouchers and hampers to the families of their employees because they were like, we're really sorry that we're encroaching on in your home because a lot of people don't have an office at home. So they're working from the kitchen table. Uh, so we had clients send hampers to families and packs for the kids to try and keep them occupied as well. Um, we had a client that um, worked in travel. I mean, you know how disrupted the travel sector has been and still is. So they had a Zoom for an hour every week with the MD right at the start of the pandemic. He gave them an update on the business and then he opened up for a Q&A session. 20 months later, he is still doing that. Now, as you can imagine, a lot of people had to be let go during that pandemic. And now this company is doing quite well again. They're all knocking on the door saying we want to come back because that's the trust and, and, and the level of communication that, that was built. So, um, yeah, we had people getting uh, massage vans in to come and do massages for, for people and stuff. It was, um, yeah, it was it's phenomenal. The, the online exercise classes went down really well, got a high level of, uh, of engagement because it catered for all levels. It didn't matter whether you were Arnold Schwarzenegger or, like me, a bit of a couch potato, you could still get involved. <laughs> if you'd have said Arnold Schwarzenegger like you, Richard, you'd have been you'd have, you'd have done an hour interview with us today. But anyway, <laughs> you've missed your chance. Um, so the, you've mentioned a few things there that um, I think we're all aware of the kind of things that we've all done in our businesses. And some of the things have stayed and some, some of them haven't. I mean, 20 months ago, we hadn't done an online event. We've done dozens now and, and we like doing them and people like watching them. So there's something good. Those are things that we might retain. What do you think people are going to retain, uh, take forward in these engagement and communication strategies that they've learned over these past 20 months? where we've seen, again, people forced to communicate online because they've not been in an office and had those daily chats. They've found that actually there's, it's, it's very effective to, to have time booked in to do that feedback. So whereas they might not have done that before, in a in a more formalized setting they'll they'll take that forward we still see a lot of people doing online there is still a lot of certain uncertainty out there and especially with this new variant we've yeah. seen a lot of people want to go back to working from home and again where we've seen companies really shine is that just because we were allowed to start coming back to the office or whatever they carried on doing the things that they were that they were doing before so you know um the the lunch the lunch sessions the exercise sessions just the q a getting access to somebody who can answer your questions is <coughs> massively important lisa uh, another one then you've used the word office several times in our conversation yeah. so far so let's just just flip this i mean are there certain sectors to which this becomes a much more difficult opportunity you know the, absolutely, absolutely and i wonder if you could describe um perhaps what those those areas are and how you talk to them about engagement well-being you, you it's not about working from home you've literally still got to go to work how, yeah yeah how do you deal with it on that side lisa yep so we've got clients who are delivery drivers warehouse distribution pickers packers they've been in throughout all this they've kept us going haven't they bless them um so yeah for, for them you know um a lot of them have smartphones so you can get zoom and things on your smartphone so we've tried that it's not worked with everybody not everybody no. engages with that but we've gone to them and said listen how can we make you feel more included how can we check in on you what is what can we do to make to you know how can you tell us you're okay so there's whatsapp groups there's text messages there's little sheets envelopes that go out to them to say you know how are you feeling on a scale of one to ten what can we do to make you feel better so whilst we might not be able to have this dialogue and everybody jump on a zoom because they're probably halfway down the m6 delivering our food you know what we, what we have so. been able to do yeah is is get that is get that feedback in writing and, and and what happens as long as you follow through like i said it's all about that full circle so if we're getting a lot of questionnaires in from truck drivers and we're ignoring them that's terrible but if we're going oh do you know what four, four of the drivers have said if we just like sent out a little memo or a little gift card to thank people so we did it so then you had more drivers engaging because we've done what they've asked, we've listened, they felt like they've had a voice. So again, I think that, 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 that takes me right back to the beginning of the conversation, I think really, where sometimes it's just the willingness to do it, um, even, if, even if it's not a, a super 100% success, the willingness to attempt better communication, engagement, to consider well-being. And that, it's, it, it's almost that willingness is, is a really important part of this, one step away from the results sometimes. 
It always, it always is. It always is. You know, like I said right at the start, we're okay with bad news. We're okay with hearing that, no, what you're not going to take my idea up. What we're not okay with is being ignored. So if, some, if I came and said, I've got this amazing idea, Richard, I think we should do this at the magazine. If you ignored me, I'd be a bit cross. If you came yeah. and said, Lisa, that's the worst idea I've ever heard in my life, but thank you for taking the time. I'm more likely to come back and try again with another idea. And it's the same in any context, you know, as long as you are acknowledging that that person's had a go and you give them the respect that they're due, then it just encourages them to, to try again. And explaining your rationale as to why it's a no is, is really good practice as well. And eventually somebody will come with something and you'll be like, oh my goodness, why did we not think of that? Let's do it. And then the buzz that that employee gets, oh my gosh, I'm part of this. That was me that did that. And, but it has to be consistent. You can't just do it once. No, You've got I to agree. keep going and keep going. We say to our clients, if you're not going out and asking people for their opinions at least once a quarter, just forget it. There's no point. It needs to be consistent. Last thing, that's great, Alisa. That last, last, last thing for you. You've had, a, you've had a, um, in a business sense, you've had a very, very strong year. And I wonder which of the communication, engagement, and well-being strategies that you've implemented at your workplace do you think has produced the most results for you? So even pre-pandemic, I've always had a massively flexible culture um, and we encourage our clients to do the same. So I always say to my team, don't care what hours you work, don't care when you work, as long as I never get a phone call from a client saying that they can't get hold of you, we focus on outputs, we focus on our clients being happy, we get results from our clients. I touch base with our clients to say, you know, is Claire treating you well, is Stuart treating you well, uh, and, and, and get that feedback. So my team are professionals. I respect them. They respect me. Until the day somebody lets me down, then I'll deal with, with that person. I don't think that will ever happen. But yeah, I always say, if you want to go and get your hair done at two o'clock on a Tuesday, go. I don't care because they'll probably, <laughs> they'll probably, you know, sit there till six o'clock that night to, um, to, to, to make the time up. And that's just the level of flexibility that, that we have here. And it's been really successful for us because they're engaged because they know that I trust them. I give them the autonomy to get on with the job. Um, and yeah, I respect them. Thank you, Lisa. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Lisa, don't go away. Lisa, staying with us, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but to join Lisa, I'd like to welcome our panelists. David Booth is Senior International and Corporate Account Specialist at the Sante Group. His role is to maintain exclusive partnerships with corporate and international insurance providers, which allows the business to design and deliver class-leading health, well-being, and insurance protection strategies for clients that operate around the world. Rob Hallam is Managing Director at Big Tank Video Productions and has been involved in the media industry for more than 20 years on both sides of the camera as a mainstream television presenter and producer before founding Big Tank in 2005. Among the clients of Big Tank are Mercedes-Benz Trucks, Stevenson's Lawyers, the Department for International Trade and Polyfloor. Um, Adrian Leather is Chief Executive for Active Lancashire and also Business Health Matters. He's worked in Lancashire for more than 20 years and he's committed to improving opportunities for the county and celebrating its strengths and uniquenesses. Lee Chambers is the founder of Essentialized Workplace Wellbeing and a director of Wellbeing Lancashire. As a psychologist and coach with a background in local government and elite sports, he provides data-driven wellbeing strategy and delivers and excuse me and delivery tactics. And with Wellbeing Lancashire, He's on a mission to embed well-being as a key indicator for future growth. Lee won the Great British Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Service industry, Industries in 2021. And frankly, is always on the flipping telly and the radio. Welcome to you all. Good morning. And it's lovely to see you all. Um, I'm going to come to you first, if I may, David. Well-being and engagement are not new ideas, but I think they've been given new names perhaps, and we've certainly focused on them more than ever in the past two years. I wonder, David, what have you learned? Good question. Um, I think, I think if anything, it's heightened what small parts of what we knew already. Um, and I, I think one of the things we focus on a lot is mental health well, mental health has been significant on a significant rise in in the past few years not just the um the tracing of it but the understanding of it and i think if anything one major thing that employers have learned is or, or and heighten their learning is prevention is way way better than the cure um so i think a lot of what lisa's just said about communication implementing strategies 
is crucial to being able to enhance not only your, your business and how your business performs, but also enhance the individuals that are in there as well. So a lot of the, like you mentioned, the new terminology that's been coming out, a lot of the new products are all around being able to help employers understand how to spot signs of mental health and how to improve it overall. Because let's be honest, business owners and people who run businesses aren't the oracles. Um, they, they, they're very good at what they do, but they need help as well. So a lot of what we've seen around the advancements of the, of the health and well-being world is, is around being able to assist those business owners and people who run the businesses and being able to be a, a, a workforce and a workplace that, that has the help that's there to improve the employers and make them the best they can be. You described there, David, you know, I think what you described in there for personnel is that there are personal growth opportunities that are coming through from this. Is that, is that fair, that the, the, the personal growth opportunities are being recognised and maybe put into that basket of communication, well-being and engagement? Definitely, definitely, because um, you, you, your employees run your workforce. They're the ones that are the ones that are on the floor. Um, throughout the working day and if they're not if they're not at full capacity if they're not able to thrive in themselves then they're not they're not going to be able to do what you what you want them to do in your in your business so spending that time out as as Lisa said earlier communicating with them understanding with them and treating them as individuals and then being able to let them give them the platform to be able to enhance themselves and thrive is what's going to improve your business and and make your business successful. And you gave us a little bit of a hint there. Um, you see, it's not you, you can't. It's it's not reasonable really to expect that all bosses or all business owners are all brilliant at everything, and and business owners need help with with these matters. But I wonder if we can take it a bit further. Do you think that you know the business owners that you come across, the senior managers that you come across, very good at looking after their people? How good are they are they at looking after themselves? Great question. Um, it's very well. I think it's 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 important for them because they they they've learned as they've gone along. So when whenever they're looking at these products that have come to market, or um, or actually understanding the products that they already had in place for their staff, when they've not actually fully understood what they do, when they've looked at it themselves, I think it is a hint to them to say, look, you you. It's a simple question. To them, do you do you know how you feel? You are feeling. Are you? Um, are you worried? Are you are you stressed? Are you at risk of burnout? Because this th these 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 strategies that we put in place for clients are for the business owners as well. So great question. I think I think it's a learning curve for them definitely, um, as well as as well as the employees that they have. Thanks very much, Rob Hallam. If I just just bring it to you, staying with the same question, what do you think you've learned, and what do you think employers have learned about well being and engagement? over these past couple of years? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, thanks for, for giving me the opportunity to, to chat today. And Lisa and David, absolutely well said it. It's, um, I kind of equate it to the, the like culture at the minute that I think as a company, we have a bit of an issue with, with sort of social media in that, you know, things are liked, therefore everything's fine. And when you think about that process of what liking can be, it's that just touching a screen and that has liked something. And I think traditionally in, workplaces you'll see you know a member of staff are you okay yeah good job that you know i've liked that i've scratched the surface we can move on um and i think what we've learned and what i've learned from you know friends in you know uh, businesses you know across the country and overseas that you never actually know so you know that the old saying of the door is always open uh, it has to be and, and again as lisa beautifully put it's got to be genuine um, and I think here, that there's, I think there's two things that have made it easier for us to look after the team. And there's only eight of us and we're all in one building. Uh, but also all my adult life, I've uh, struggled, I suppose, uh, but hopefully championing um, mental health. And I think that gives me uh, a great insight to know that, you know, when someone is smiling at you and saying everything is fine, that it might not be. And to know you're really fine. Yeah, exactly. And for, and for the team here to know that, look, if you if you're feeling because aside from what's going on at work and, you know, we're 100 percent up at the minute, you don't know what's going on at home. You don't know what other, you know, if, if and it's never happened. But if someone feels they're going to burst into tears at work, you're not going to get fired. 
you know, uh, come and chat. It, it, you know, that that's and it's just I think the whole thing is being genuine and genuinely, you know, there for each other. Thanks. And Rob, how much do you think, I mean, what you've learned and what you've seen others learn, how much do you think you will be keen to take forward, you know, to, to, to retain within the business this idea of um, thought through, uh, considered, strategized uh, engagement, well-being and communication? It has to be the, the norm. At the risk of, of suddenly losing all my clients, your clients aren't more important than your you know, than, than your staff. All right, you could say without clients, we don't have a business. But if, if you know, if the team here aren't feeling good and aren't firing on all cylinders, how can they be good for your clients? So I think you've got to get your, you know, if, if, you know, especially as we come up to the end of year, you know, pressures are up busier than ever. But if your team aren't, don't feel that they're, they're, they're looked after or that, you know, they can express themselves and suggest things, um, it, it, it's a it's a, a finite process something will give and then you're no good to your clients anyway so Thanks. i think absolutely just be totally genuine with your team and and, and know that 100 percent we're all there for each other thanks rob um lee chambers welcome uh, uh, lee i wonder if you could reflect on that you advise a lot of businesses on on on, on in all kinds of areas but certainly in this area what do you think employers have learned? How do you think they've changed over the last couple of years? And what do you think they will carry forward, Lee? Yeah, I think they're becoming a lot more conscious uh, around the aspects in terms of not only the employee's experience and how much trust and communication play a part in that, but also starting to look from a more business perspective as well. How is implementing this going to impact our KPIs? How can we attach it to some of the business processes that we already do? And how can we start to, I suppose in some ways, formalize our strategies rather than just doing what's trendy or thinking, well, it's a good thing to do. I see more businesses starting to see, well, actually, it's an essential part of our strategy. How can we build it into our everyday interactions? How can we build it into some of the processes and pillars that we have already established in the business? And what that does is it makes it more sustainable. It starts to give a vision of you know, what the budget is actually going to directly impact. And ultimately, it makes, a, it makes an interconnected way of looking at aspects around communication, well-being, inclusion and sustainability as not only a method to connect your business together and understand how you can start to look at the future and to tackle some of those challenges that are incoming, also start to see how that can be used more often than not, to retain talent and to attract the next generation of talent because more often they are willing to question and ask about those areas and look for businesses that are more purposeful in the way that they interact. Thanks. Uh, Lee, how, when you're in with these businesses, how do you measure, um, measure the success of your work? Because I, I suppose if we can work out what the measures of success are, we can understand what we should be trying to achieve. Yeah, I suppose one of the interesting things, Richard, is for a company, they need to start to look at what outcomes they are looking to attain. Yeah. So that might be up in productivity. It might be reducing sickness or staff turnover. It might be looking at some aspects around their engagement surveys or pulse surveys and seeing how they can you know, directly impact certain metrics of the things they already measure. Or they might be looking back to staff surveys and seeing, OK, so we have a particular area that's been highlighted. We want to directly work on that. And what's interesting is when a business decides to look at the outcomes and start to make a decision about what they want to move towards, the overall engagement from senior leadership is higher because they've identified their why. And more than anything, they can start to look how they're going to implement things for the employees because they've got a benchmark. And then they can look in the future, is it working? If not, evolve it, change it. Is it working? Can we do more? What else can we do? Thanks, Lee. I wonder if I can come to you, Lisa. The, 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 Lee's got me thinking there. The idea of um, these are things that we should do. You know, that's perhaps where it starts. These are things that we should do. These are things we should think about. Um, do, w what point does it move to these are the things we really want to do? I always think it's employee-led. Um, I'm a massive advocate of it, it being in, in employee led. So, you know, when we want we want to do these things because our people want to do them. And when we do these things, our people are more engaged. You know, Rob hit the nail on the head when he talked about employees being more important than customers. Um, you know, when people want to put their employees first and when people do put their employees first, it, you feel it. And I know that sounds 
odd but you feel it we have so many clients when we've been in to do sessions with them that come away and say oh my god the buzz for that week after you've been in and the engagement I, I want I want to do more of it so it's it's how we feel isn't it everything always comes down to an experience we do what we do because we want to experience different things so I think it is all down to that um that when you when you see the results and you see your people happy and buzzing and productivity go you want to do more of it thanks <coughs> excuse me uh, adrian coming to you um i think some of the things we're describing you know, feel very good these are these are these are good things but i wonder if out in the real world some of this doesn't feel so good for for bosses in certain sectors or certain industries you know, the bosses that say i just need jobs to get done i suppose where i'm coming to how do we balance the demands for what we know or what we believe will be the right thing for our people, you know, shorter hours perhaps, or like Lisa says, it's uh, outputs rather than clocking in and clocking out. We're offering increased benefits for people. Uh, all these things come at a cost to business. Um, what do we say to the employees who say, ah, we just got to crack on? That's a, a really interesting question. And I mean, um, we have to ask ourselves that deep question. Do they really come at a cost? I mean, the evidence is saying, and it's it's come out over the last year of people have got more used to, to home working. Six out of 10 people are indicating, you know, from the surveys, they're working harder, they're being more productive. There's only about, there's only just over 10% of people who the evidence says are not being as productive as they were before. And as, as Lisa and Rob and David and Lee have said, there's this whole element, isn't there, about trust and satisfaction and retention, which have been absolutely critical. I mean, paradoxical, let's, let's just have that reality check. Being out of the office has shortened the relationship with the employer, hasn't it? Yeah, just as Rob was saying earlier on, we would, we would ask people how they were and they, people just say that they're fine. But now we have a really intimate understanding of what's going on in the lives of those people and the employer is far more part of that relationship. And by being part of that relationship, it's paying dividends. Yes, at the start of the uh, pandemic, we saw mental health issues absolutely go off the mixed scale. And we have to accept that. And they really did, particularly for the, the SMEs and the owner, the owner managers, they, those very um, exposed businesses. But those have bounced back. And um, there's, there's an awareness that uh, longer term, we're going to have to deal with things like physical health. People have put weight on, you know, on average, people have gained over a kilogram. So, you know, starting in January, we need to think about what we're going to do about that. And that might become a business, uh, that might become a business issue, you know, as people start to develop long term conditions. But productivity has gone up and uh, recruitment and recruiting and retaining people through this new method of working from home. It's great for businesses. We've seen definitely reduction in costs for businesses with not having to open offices, uh, reduced levels of travel, and that's got a direct employee benefit as well. But the key thing really is about the, the gain in the trust and the respect and the harmony which now exists within businesses. And that's a critical success factor in terms of people's mental health and as we as we spoke about, one of the precursors to good productivity. Thank you very much, David. If I can come back to you, David, just listening to Adrian there. Um, how do you manage these matters for your clients? Though this idea of um, you know the the, com the the difficult conversations that you'll be having, I'm sure, with clients who say they're working from home. Well, how does that how does that work for for my insurance? How does this work? How does that work? How are you managing those those conversations about? big changes in within workplaces and within work practices david um well uh, i think i think to help me i've had we, we constantly obviously have to stay up to date with the products because one one thing whether right or not that happens when they, when or, or what did happen at the start of the pandemic was insurers were racing to adapt their policies to help people include um support networks for the new ways of working so I think I think the, the hardest thing for us was was to understand what 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 they were and how we can deliver that to the um, to, to the companies. But I think one of the one of the things that I like to try and spot, and I think it's mentioned earlier, is how genuine these people are. How, how genuine are, are the people that I'm speaking to, and how how much do they actually want to to help their staff and 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 improve the benefits for their staff to to give them the help that they need and. 
Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to treat people differently if, if they give me the wrong answers, but it's, it's all about understanding their ambitions and understanding their business makeup. And also, um, it was mentioned earlier, understanding how that individual feels themselves in themselves as well. Yeah. Because, because like you said, Richard, it, it's that the, the business owners need support as well. They need the help that they're giving out to their, to their employees. So if I don't understand that, and what they're going through and how they're feeling, I'm not going to be able to help their their, their staff either. So, so it's a, it's a there's a wide range of things. So understanding the products, understanding how the 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 people making the decisions are feeling, but and also try and try and let that link into how their 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 employees may feel. Because look, business is dependent on the different different business sectors. As Lisa said earlier, if, if it's a travel industry, they're obviously going to be feeling a lot different than somebody in in a health and well-being industry like myself who's been very lucky over the past few years because of uh, stable work workforce and work environment I've had. Thank you very much. Um, Lee Chambers, I want to come, come to you. I want to get my head around the idea of inclusive workplaces a little bit. I think this feeds right into this, this piece of um, engagement, communication, well-being, retention, recruitment, and it all feeds in. Um, and we are told by research that inclusive workplaces are better and uh, more productive. And to me, inclusive is about making work available to everybody and make, ensuring that everybody can contribute in the best way that they possibly can. But I wonder, what do you, Lee, me, understand by the word inclusive? And how do we achieve better balance in our workplaces? Yeah, so for me, it, it kind of, it has a number of different strands. An inclusive workplace is somewhere where people feel they can actually bring themselves to work. Yeah. And a big part of that is having a base level of value and appreciation that they are given for the work that they do, uh, to have clarity of role, so to know what the position is, to know what they actually need to be able to do and achieve, because I suppose if you don't know that, you can, you can feel excluded because you've not got a clear vision of what you need to achieve, what you need to overcome. Um, also starting to think around those elements of autonomy and having the freedom to be able to do your best work and We've Ooh, got sorry, did you lose me then? No, we, we, we did very briefly. You're still with us, sir. Okay, apologies for that. No um, problem. So, yeah, the autonomy to be able to do work and have the ability to build upon what you, what you can achieve, but also then the, the feedback constructively to be able to develop as well so you not, don't feel completely disconnected. But the inclusive workplace bit, especially when it comes to looking at, you know, the differing people that you have in an organisation, making sure that there is that level there where everyone feels like they do have a voice, they can be heard, and they have the ability to put ideas forward and ultimately use their strengths in the ways that they can push the business forward, attaching their values and what's meaningful to them to what's meaningful to the business as well and pushing that forward. And obviously that comes with a number of different aspects, the way a business is led, the capability of management to be able to foster those conversations, open up those spaces, because so often in business, the employees have the best ideas. And more often than not, they have this gut feeling, this intuition of how inclusive a workplace is. And I think the most important thing that I've seen over the past few years is for businesses not to put out into the world that they are an inclusive culture, they are a very, very open workplace, but behind the scenes, be very rigid, not very flexible, and actually, you know, don't create that trust because the employees know the truth behind the scenes. Honestly, Lee, if we get to a point from all this 20 months of and whatever, whatever's coming, where if we can get to a point where we say these things and they're meant, I think that would be quite a place to be, Lee, don't you? Yeah, and I think that, you know, if we're saying, and we've said numerous times, the future of the employee experience is trust, talent is more and more able to smell the reality of a business yeah. before they even start engaging and yeah. people are willing to ask questions now they've given an awful lot of this past 18 months they've been flexible they've acclimatized they've you know put things forward some people have been parenting from home working from home juggling all these different aspects and now the biggest question is how can you be a little bit more flexible for me and how can you as a business be making that impact on the world not just to clients, but also back into the employees and to other stakeholders, such as collaborators, the environment, and just the wider society at large.
Thank you. Now, we're almost done, ladies and gentlemen, but I, I just want to go with one more question to, to each of you. Look, look at a relatively brief answer here. But, um, and this is the idea of, of, of just expanding that idea for who's managing, who's motivating the motivators, who's leading the leaders, who's looking after the bosses, that kind of thing. So what it, just I'm asking for something personal, if I may. What have you learned? What has worked for you, either personally or within your workplace, that you think I or any of our guests could learn from who shall we start with let's start with Lisa Sauerbutz I knew you were going to come to me first um I think yeah I am um massively open and honest with my team I always I always have been um I sometimes think I'm an oversharer um but it, it works um and you know the, as well as my team being my team I feel like they're also my peers and we have that mutual trust and respect so they do check in on me. They do say, how are you doing? You know, I unfortunately suffered a, a bereavement a couple of months ago that hit me really, really hard. And my team just picked me up. They carried me. They looked after the business and I didn't have to, to worry about anything. So going right back to the start, communication, openness, honesty, transparency, just just be you and pe your people will, will look after you. Well, Lisa, you've nicked all the best words there. So, <laughs> fellas, you're going to have to come up with some very get get your Rogers thesaurus out now. Um, but I'm going to I am going to use that actually, Lisa. You've you've taken me to a much better question. Uh, same idea, but I like this. Um, David Booth, who's been checking in on you, and what works best for you? Um, honestly, everyone, everyone's checked in, um, and I think that's. Uh, it's good credit to everyone in our business. I'm, I, I do truly mean that. I've I've worked from home for ten years, ten years plus. So I think I think what I've learned over them ten years is how lonely you can feel. Um, so I I love having just 10, 15 minute conversations on the phone with with colleagues, and and I think they've they they do the same as well. And I think I think it's a credit to all of us that that it's not just one person. It's not my boss. It's not my MD. It's it is everyone that we all speak to each other and um uh, and, and help each other out thank you rob hallam same to you who's checking in on you how do you like to to manage your uh, engagement and communication and personal well-being what can you tell us yeah i think um i, I mentioned at the start that my mental health uh, journey has been uh, has been uh, interesting over the last sort of 20 years but and i had a real struggle initially with i want to tell the team especially as we grew but i don't want it to be seen as a weakness I don't want it to be used against me. So if one day I kick off because something's not done right, oh, well, you know that. But, you know, came out with it and they're brilliant. They're quite a young team and they're like, oh, wow, OK. A lot right, younger cool. than you, Rob. Well, everyone is these days. Even you, Richard, I think. Maybe not. Uh, but, um, yeah, and it was quite empowering and, and it's never been used against me by the team. But I think I had to say that because, you know, if ever, if ever those guys felt like that, I really want them to know that, it's not a crime. It doesn't make you weak. I actually think in some respects it makes me stronger because I understand how this works a bit more. I understand people, which is a big part of our business. But, you know, so what? We're only here once. And, and as long as you're not committing, I think, you know, a, a commercial, uh, you know, writing your business off by doing some big, you know, bold statements that are a bit out of, you've got to be still got to be measured because we're in a commercial world. But and what I love from today is it's all been hearing about honesty and, and honest engagement and genuinely talking. And I think that's all you need to do. L last thing from me, if you do a Google image, uh, image search for depression and anxiety, you'll see lots of black and white pictures of people like this. You'll never see that in the workplace. If someone is depressed or anxious, you will never see them, certainly not in black and white, uh, but maybe in Ramsbottom. But you'll never, you know, you'll never see this. And that's why we've got to just be genuine, open and honest with you know, with our with our with our colleagues, uh, and take a genuine interest in each other. And if you don't mind me saying, keep smiling, Rob, because because that, that was a great answer to a very difficult question. Um, uh, coming to you, Adrian Leather. Same thing for you, really. Uh, we we're good at talking about it on behalf of others. What about whoops, whoops? I knocked over the horn. I'm sorry. Um, what about ourselves? What about looking after ourselves and our our peers who maybe are competitors or our friends in other businesses? I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question and it's something that we need to talk about more. And I'm always um, mindful of how many organisations that I work with have got that value about everyone counts. 
And I tell you what, that's been tested, hasn't it, over the last 20 oh, months. Absolutely. And the thing that I've learned is I've learned more about my work colleagues, um, you know, within my business and other partners. I now know about their lives. I can genuinely say that we are a family focused organisation. And going back to those conversations about recruitment and retention, people want to join our business and want to be part of our, our ethos and our way of working because of that, because it extends out because we live in that. So that value base and how that, that is lived in terms of those 15 minute conversations that people have, checking in with each other, can tell because they've got that depth of understanding, which we didn't have before, We've all adapted to this technology really, really well, and it's not going away. So we just need to go into it wholesale. And we really need to be investing in those conversations. And uh, as, for me as an organization, for, for us as an organization, that's something that we're really proud about. And our staff are proud about as well. And that sense of looking after each other, that has done so much to create that trust and that changing culture and people want to be with our organisation and associated that because we know we're doing it well. We could do it better, but we're doing it well and thank we you. are living our values. Adrian, thank you very much. And finally, um, Lee, Lee Chambers, I see you on the telly, I hear you on the radio, you, you join us in forums like this, I hear you speak. You are one of the great motivators, you're one of the great people who makes other free people feel better about themselves. How do you get motivated and how do you get to feel better about yourself, Lee? Yeah, I think so much of it, Richard, is that while I am quite noisy out in the world trying to support other people, what people don't see is just how much the Lancashire Business Support Network is there for me. And obviously with a very young business that's still very small in scope, even as we've moved and started working more nationally, it is fellow Lancashire business owners and collaborators that are the ones who check in on me who keep me on track, who keep me accountable to myself, who keep me ensuring that I'm actually switching off every now and again. And even more so within our kind of health and well-being, you know, network within Lancashire, we actually all look after each other in a way that is something amazing. And even for you, Richard, when you call me every month to make sure I'm, uh, you know, make sure I'm behaving myself, just those little moments are so important. And obviously, you know, for LBV, they foster that ability for us to come together and support each other through the events, through the publications and for everything that you do. So interestingly, you are a driver of my own well-being and you will also find that for so many people throughout Lancashire that actually bringing business together and collaborating creates those relationships that allow conversations to happen when people do need support and are struggling. Uh, there's a reason why I love to live and to work here and I think Lee Chambers has just summed it up in about a minute and a half so thank you for that Lee uh, thank, and thank, thank you everybody you've, you've, you've quite, quite caught me there my friend um, thank you all our panellists and, and, and to those of you who sent your questions I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all but thank you for sending them and, and that, that does conclude our, our formal business for today but please stick around and have a chat these, some of these people will be hanging out with us uh, and so do stick around for a, a conversation over a uh, in, in a group format in a few minutes and we'll bring you all on screen. I, I really do hope there's something that you can take from today's event and using your business. I know there's a few things that I've scribbled down that I'm going to be using in my world and my business. And when you do, when you do implement some of these strategies, let us know because those are the kind of stories that, that bring Lancashire business to you, really bring us to life. It's the stories where you've met somebody because of this and guess what, that. It's an amazing thing. So before we move to networking, I need to thank again our patrons, partners, and our supporters. That's Beaver and Struthers, Big Tank Productions, Burnley.co.uk, Burnley College, Cotton Court, Infor Group, Lancashire Skills Hub, Nugent Sante, Zigaflow, AMRC, Lexus Preston, and Boost Business Lancashire. And of course, our headline patron, CG Professional. Thanks again, of course. Please, ladies and gentlemen, tap your teacups, dunk your croissants, whatever you need to do. Give it up big style and Lancashire style for Lisa Salbutz, Rob Hallam, Adrian Leather, Lee Chambers and David Booth. You can read about this session online at lancashirebusinessview.co.uk later today. We are available for all these sessions to view on demand at our YouTube channel and there will be an extended feature on Lancashire Business Week in our next printed issue, which is out in January. We will be back at the same time tomorrow when we will be putting leading and managing change under the spotlight. I dare say we'll drift again into that idea of looking after the leaders, but I think it's a good topic. 
On Friday, you can join us live and in person at the AMRC for our Resilience to Recovery Forum. Register at the, where do we register boys? In the chat box and tell your friends all are welcome. I have been Richard Slater. If you can buy it in Lancashire, buy it in Lancashire. And if you can sell it around Lancashire, you can sell it around the world. See you tomorrow. It's been a hoot. Thank <laughs> you.